Now, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Lord of the Rings? You ever seen that movie? Okay, there's one part in that movie where Frodo looks at Gandalf and says, I wish it need not have happened in my lifetime, Gandalf. Gandalf replies, so do I. And so do all who have seen such times in that kind of voice he gives. But it's not for them to decide. All we have to decide on is what to do with the time that has been given. That's so true, isn't it? All we have to do is to decide on what to do with the time that's been given. In the season that we're navigating through, we've been forced to reevaluate what is essential and what is not. And so I've spoken to pastors over the last few months, and they've said that before COVID, what was essential is getting everybody into this room. Well, COVID happened in 16 weeks, 17 weeks of, of not getting everybody into this room, and it quickly caused us to reevaluate what truly is essential and what isn't. Maybe more essential than getting people on seats is actually realizing that people matter. One of the things we said is more important than delivering content that we're delivering right now to people who are scattered all across our community in this nation and around the world is actually connecting with the people who are watching it. That's about the church. That's the mission of the gospel. It's about God connecting with us. And so as difficult as this season has been, it forced a reevaluation. It, it forced us to reevaluate things that we thought were important, like the Christmas store, for example. And maybe they're not as essential in the world we're in right now as they once were. Just as important as kind of thinking through what is important and isn't, is also rediscovering those essential parts of our lives that maybe we'd forgotten about. Pope Francis said this, this is a season to choose what matters and what passes away. It's a time to separate what is necessary from what is not. Now, Gandalf said that no one wants to live through a time like this. And I guess that's true, but I also know from my own experience that living through times like this is what it needs for me to take a, a hard stop reality check about what's really important and what isn't. I think that's going to happen in the church. And quite honestly, I think that's what's happening right now in Christians. If latest research is to be believed, then when the church is fully open, American churches will see a 25 to 33% reduction in their post-COVID attendance to their pre-COVID attendance. In other words, COVID will have resulted in one of the greatest migrations from the church in a short period of time. Any of you heard that Rip Van Winkle story? No Rip Van Winkle, he goes into the forest, he sleeps, and he comes out 20 years later and everything is different? It's kind of what will have happened in COVID. All the thrill about going online and all these numbers of people who are watching will give birth to a reality that is going to shock many people. I thought it would take five, maybe 10 years for us to get to a spiritual reality that, that is like Europe or is like uh, the Australasia, New Zealand and Australia. Maybe it's going to take us another three months. And I tell you, in that reality, and even right now, there are people in here and there are people online who are evaluating what is essential and what isn't. And in this season, people are starting to to make those considerations. But what's interesting in all of this is according to a Pew research, a majority, of Christ, a majority of people in America have been praying that this pandemic would end. In fact, 15% of those people who say they never pray at all and seldom pray at all will admit to praying that this thing just goes away. See, what's happening in this season is everyone is reevaluating. There appears to be that renewed awareness of the need to reevaluate things, to take care not just of our physical health, which is what we're, we're trying to do right now, but also of our mental health, our emotional health, and also of our spiritual health as well. 
And so we're starting this series, Essential, and we, we want to remind ourselves of what God considers to be essential. It is my hope and prayer that as we go through this series, something will inspire you, something will challenge you, even something will trouble you to rethink what your life is really being lived for. As with our Christmas store decision, I think some of us are going to realize that we're going to have to make some really, really hard choices. And I want to remind you, often we think vision, purpose in life comes by what we say yes to. In a season like this, we will be reminded that vision and purpose is often lived out best when we say no to certain things. If you were to show me your calendar, I would be able to show you what is truly important. And to put some of these essential things back in, maybe we need to stop doing some of the things that we're doing. So we're doing this because right now people are reevaluating. It is highly possible that in a few months the church in America will emerge from this. Christians are going through this and we're making these choices and we will, one way or the other, come out different. The question is, how will we emerge? How will you emerge? Now it's central. We consider it is essential to amplify the hope and life of Jesus to all people and we do that by empowering local leaders, leading local churches to equip followers to live with God in community and on mission. Mike already said that. But this with God part is, I think, the foundation for it all. And it's central. We are committed to developing personal and corporate habits for a dynamic relationship with God. And at the heart of this is the emphasis on prayer and the study of the Scriptures as critical habits that, notice this, help us discern the plans and purposes of God for our lives. Notice that last phrase, help us discern the plans and purposes of God for our lives. In other words, for us, we understand Christianity to be driven by relationship and not rituals. And I'm going to dig into this through this message. We understand Christianity to be a relationship not a ritual. And so prayer and the study of scriptures relate to the relationship. They are not rituals that we do. And I think many of us get this wrong. I was thinking of an analogy to, um, to use for this. And uh, I've got to say, I used this analogy, and over there this morning, when I used this analogy, somebody went, oh, no, I don't know whether they were protecting themselves from the abomination that I'm about to speak, but I, I trust that you will uh, not think I'm being irreverent with this. I, I believe that the study of Scripture and prayer are to our relationship with God what date nights are to our relationship with our spouse. I want you to think about that. Date nights were not the reason I committed to Vipka, but they certainly maintain the intimacy that I enjoy with her. I believe in the same way prayer and the study of the Scriptures do not create the intimacy that I enjoy with God, but they maintain it. They deepen it. What created the intimacy that you enjoy with God? Was it not the entire Christ event? Which means the incarnation, God taking on flesh, the sinless life, the atoning death, burial, resurrection, and then the ascension. In that moment, all of the sin that separated us from God was gone and we could enjoy Fellowship with the Father again. Intimate fellowship with the Father. What was needed? Jesus went up in, so that the Holy Spirit could come down. And for all who have basically personally responded and said yes to Jesus as Lord, He comes and makes His home in us so that we can enjoy intimacy with Him. Prayer and the study of Scriptures do not create intimacy with God. Jesus did that. The Spirit does that. Prayer and the study of scriptures maintain and deepen the intimacy we enjoy with God. Now, 
let me confess something. When COVID-19 hit, the massive prob, uh, challenge it posed to our church and the churches in our network led me to work hours and hours on end, seemingly without an end. I mean, some people think, hey, pastors only work on a Sunday. Man, you can't even meet on a Sunday. This must be so great. Oh, Lord, no. I, I mean, as if managing all of this isn't enough, we've also got 10 churches around the world that were being hit with this at the same time. I would work long hours, day after day after day after day. And I'm going to confess something here. During that period, I let my date nights with Vipka slip. Now, Vipka and I caught up every day. You know the handover? How was the day? Kids okay? Yeah, we did all that. We were relating. But I let the date night slip. I mean, in my mind, I'm like, hey, everything's closed. Where do we go, right? <laughs> Wrong. Now, I have an amazing wife who is more than understanding of the craziness of the season. Now, I thought, it's okay, hon, we're going to go on vacation, June. Then our governor does what a governor does, and then all of a sudden, a massive pressure on regathering and reopening happens. I cancel the vacation, the family go away without me, I'm sitting here working on our regathering plan. Now, I'm sharing that with you to say this, what do you think happens when a relationship doesn't experience the dating. What do you think happens? The dynamism wanes, right? Now, wives, don't look at your husbands too long because I can see it. <laughs> now, again, I have an amazing wife who understood the season that we were in. And since we've regathered, I'm sharing this because I've kind of made that course correction, right? But my points are these. This is where I'm going with this. The foundation for my intimacy with my wife was not created through the date nights. It wasn't created that way. Where was it created? It was created at the front of an altar 26 years ago when we looked at one another and we said yes to one another in the presence of God. It was created years ago. Second, neglecting the very fact and the very need for intimacy be, to be deepened and maintained. It didn't destroy our relationship. We're not heading for the divorce court. It just weakened the dynamism, the connection, that kind of makes it all buzz. See, a lack of intimate connection with a spouse doesn't result in a divorce. Now, for some people, it results in triggering certain patterns of behavior that are often brought up in a divorce court. But what it does do, if it doesn't lead there, is it does mean that we fall into this habit of staying together for the sake of the kids. We catch up, we relate, it's just not dynamic anymore. And fortunately, life has a habit of causing us to treat marriage like a ritual. We forget the importance of nurturing the relationship. And when we don't nurture the relationship, all of us are aware, right? The reality, the dynamism dies. I want to suggest to you that in the same way of a lack of connection with God doesn't mean to say that you will walk away from the faith. Now, I could say you carry that on for a long time, and it may well result in that. Why do you think it is possible that in a few months, if surveys are to be believed, and by the way, the polls were wrong in 2016, they may be wrong on this too, but they're not going to be that much wrong. How do you think it's possible for people who have made it a practice to go to church for years on end to suddenly come to COVID reality, go through COVID, and then COVID ends, and they never come back through the door? How is that possible? They've had a relationship with God that was cultivated on a decision that they made with God maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, maybe in a children's ministry class, maybe at the front of an altar, but that relationship has never been nurtured or cultivated in terms of a dynamic, it being a dynamic relationship with God. And as a result of that, COVID hits, and they never come back. Never come back. I want to ask you the serious question as we go through this series. How dynamic is your relationship with God? How dynamic is your relationship with God? Is it a ritual? Or is it a relationship? 
And if it is a relationship, and let's remember, the Bible in Ephesians says, it offers this comparison. It offers this kind of parallel. The relationship with Christ and his church is like the relationship between what? A man and his wife. It's a relationship. So how dynamic is your relationship with God? Just as a marriage is not a ritual, but a relationship that needs nurturing, I want to suggest to you that it is essential that you nurture your relationship with God. Now, there are many habits, right, rituals, routines, practices that cultivate our relationship with God. We haven't got time to go into all of those, but for us here at Central, we emphasize two. Scripture, the Word, and prayer. Why those two? Well, at the heart of the, of the Christ event is the reality that Jesus Christ has two resources available to him in his life as a man. Two. The first was he had the word of God that he was schooled in from infancy. One of the first stories that we remember is of Jesus as a young boy who was lost by Mary and Joseph. And where did his parents find him? in the temple, and he says, didn't you realize I would be in my father's house? He was schooled in it from, from uh, infancy. Have you ever wondered why the Son of God needed to study the Word of God? I mean, didn't he know it? As I've said over and over again, the reason the Son of God took on flesh was not to act like God, but to act like the sons and daughters of God should have acted, but because of the controlling power of sin could not. He set us the example, the Word. The other resource he had was the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God led the Son of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the adversary. You remember this one? He's fasting for 40 days, and as he's fasting, the adversary knows that Jesus is hungry. So he says, hey, Jesus, why don't you just take this stone here and, and turn it into, uh, into bread? Now, see, the adversary knows who he is. He knows that Jesus can mobilize the divine attribute of omnipotence and just do things that's impossible for us to do. But what does Jesus say? I don't live by bread alone, but by every mouth that proceeds from the, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, when you look at this, Jesus had the Spirit and He had the Scriptures. And how did Jesus practice the presence of God through prayer? There are many habits that we could emphasize, but when we look at the life of Jesus, we see prayer and the Scriptures are the very tools the Spirit of God uses to make us more like Christ. So we emphasize those. So, the obvious question we need to ask now is, why are they so important? Why are these things so important? How do they relate to that dynamic relationship with God? Now, I can answer in a lot of ways this, but I want to focus on, on uh, these two practices, on the change that happens on the inside, the change that happens emotionally, mentally, spiritually, how whole we become when we make these two practices a part of our life. Now, I'm encouraging here prayer and the study of Scriptures, but I want to make sure that we're aware of something. We are not faithful when we pray and study Scripture. Now, that's going to shock you. We focus on prayer and Scripture not because we are faithful when we do them, but because they are vital habits to truly being alive. Let me put it like this. Prayer and Scripture don't prove we are, we are faithful, but they prepare us for dynamic faithfulness. For some of you, the goal of your life, the goal of your spiritual life is to, is to be able to wake up every day and not have to fight this, this kind of dread that it comes to, okay, I need to have my quiet time. It's as if the sum goal of your entire Christian life is to have a quiet time. If you have a quiet time, you're faithful. No, the quiet time is not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is faithfulness and obedience. Some of us struggle with our quiet times because we set the bar at the lowest possible level. So, prayer and Scripture are the tools that the Spirit uses to prepare us to be faithful. See, the Spirit uses these to help us discern the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, Hebrews 4.12. 
The Spirit uses these to speak truth to our hearts in the areas that we need it most, and who knows what that would be in a moment. Maybe some of you are in here right now, and, and your, your, your self-esteem is so low, and so the, what the Spirit wants to do is to take the truth, and He wants to reform your mind theologically. Maybe it's pastorally you're struggling because you're just going personally through a hard time. Maybe it's motivationally. You've lost all the enthusiasm and energy for life. The Spirit takes the Word of God, and through the practice of prayer, He st- helps us discern what we need to hear. Thirdly, the Spirit also provides us with that God mindset that can guide our thoughts and our actions. Insight, insight. It's preparing us to be faithful. What I'm saying here is that life with God is an inside-out life. It's an inside-out life. And see, here's the point. While there's value in imposing external discipline, Outside pressure on some of those internal things that we're battling, those things that God knows about, nobody else does. While there's value in doing that, if your Christian life is always about denying what you want to do on the inside, then I tell you, you're to be pitied more than most. What kind of life is that? What kind of life is it to live a life constantly denying yourself what your heart truly wants? And yet many of us think that that's what the Christian life is. It's just about saying no. I can't become a Christian because if, it, if I become a Christian, then I just need to say no to so many things. Have you ever thought it possible through the, that through practicing the presence of God in the Scriptures and through prayer that the Spirit of God is powerful enough to change what your heart desires? So that all of a sudden your faith is no longer about saying no and imposing rules and regulations on your life to manage that part of you that wants to do things you know you shouldn't do, all of a sudden, your life is about doing those things that give God glory and make you truly happy. Inside-out life. And yet for far too many of us, the life of faith isn't dynamic and for, all, for many of us, when we struggle and wrestle in a certain area, it's about imposing the kind of external discipline on an internal desire. And friends, for many of us, that is a really good thing. There have been many days in my life where I've had to have that reality, where the best I could do was to do the right thing even when I didn't feel like it. But I tell you, that's not the way that it's supposed to be. That's not a dynamic relationship with God. And I'm focusing on the inside components of this message simply because I truly believe that God wants us in this season to get back to what's truly important, and that is that we have a dynamic relationship with Him. You see, a key purpose of prayer and the study of Scriptures is to help us manage the inner life. God wants outward actions. Of course He does, but He wants us to have an inner response to Him with heart and mind. I mean, think about it. First Chronicles 28 and verse 9 tells us that God searches all hearts and understands every thought and every intent. Jesus declared in Revelation 2, 23, I am He who searches the minds and hearts. He told the Pharisees in Luke 16, 15, God knows your hearts. David was so aware of this that in Psalm 51 and verse 6, he says, you desire truth in my innermost being. Inside out. And if you think about it too, hasn't God nearly always opposed those people who do things outwardly while their heart seems to be so far away from him? Jesus spoke to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, 7 and 8, and he said this, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Now understand this, hypocrisy is not simply saying one thing and doing another one. Hypocrisy in the Bible is even saying good things, but doing it with a heart that wants to do nothing of the sort. And again, if the best that we can do is to do the right thing for the right reasons, then That's good, but let's be courageous enough to acknowledge, Holy Spirit, you need to do a work on my heart because what is right here, I really don't feel like doing. In Matthew 23, 27 and 28, Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! 
For you are like whitewashed washed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, if hypocrisy was simply saying one thing and doing another one, when Jesus opposed the Pharisees for their interpretation of the law, he called them a hypocrite because they were saying the right thing, but they were doing the wrong thing. That's not true at all. They were saying the wrong thing, and they were doing the wrong thing. Why? Because their hearts were so far from God. They'd been so concerned about what was happening out there and getting their outward life right that their heart had drifted to the point where everything about them was pretty much wrong. Friends, this is why God wants truth in our innermost being. He wants people to be right with Him on the inside, in the heart and the mind, through the Spirit, so that when things happen from our life, they're happening, happening naturally. And in fact, let's make no mistake, that is truly supernatural. See, we're most Christ-like when what's happening on the inside and what's happening on the outside are actually coming from a heart that's connected with God. Jesus had words to, to give to seven churches in the book of Revelation, and I've for a long time been struck by what he said to the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. This is what Jesus said. Now listen to it in the context of what we're talking about here. We're talking about how it's possible for us to have made a commitment to Jesus years ago and to be living off that commitment. We do the catch-ups, but there's no dynamism. It's as if we're, we're, we're existing on a past glory. And we're just riding on the whole thing. Now with that as context, listen to what Jesus says to the church in Sardis. Sardis, I know your deeds, that you have a name, and that you are alive, but you are dead. Jesus knew that though that church claimed to be healthy, in reality they were dead. Now, how does a church die? How does a church die? How does a Christian die in that regard? Sardis once enjoyed fame as a royal city. But at this point, it was nothing. The citizens of Sardis were basically living off past glory. And apparently, the same spirit had affected the church. Their loyalty and their service to Christ was now in the past. The dynamism of the past was no longer in the present. And God said he holds that against them. See, that's what happens, I think, to the insides of our hearts when we allow those external things. Even prayer and Scripture can be something like that, to be driven, to drive us to the point where it becomes the crux of our faith. When that happens, we look alive, but make no mistake about it, we're dead. And I've shared parts of my story before, but I grew up with a mom and a dad who were separated and divorced. My father was a serial adulterer. When I was about seven, my, father, uh, my mother came to Christ, and uh, it was a radical transformation. And, and my father, as I said, married five times, serial adulterer. And, and when, when, he, when I was about 12, 13, people used to look at me and they say, Craig, make sure that you t don't turn out like your dad. Make sure you don't turn out like your dad. And you know what? I never did. And let me just tell you, the church is a very good institution if you want to turn out to be nothing like your dad when your dad is a serial adulterer. The commitment to monogamy, right? The faithfulness in the marriage. It is a really good thing. But I'll tell you, I, I lived on the outside. Everything was great. But on the inside, I was bound because I was driven to turn out to be nothing like my dad. It was as if, if I allowed myself... It, to, to kind of just be me, I would end up more like my earthly dad than I would like my heavenly dad. On the outside, it looked great, but I want to tell you, on the inside, I was bound. You know why? Because my relationship with God wasn't done so dynamic that I believed that if I simply let go and let God, I would become more like Him than Him. Friends, this is the way it works. This is the way it works. We've got to allow our life to be driven from the inside out, not simply from the outside in. And the practice of prayer and Scripture are practices that the Spirit uses to change us from the inside out. I want to wrap up. I've already gone too long, so forgive me.
That's what happens when I go on vacation. Three thoughts. First, each of us here, each and every one of us, you have an inner life. Whether you're cultivating it or not, whether you're acknowledging it or not, you have an inner life. That inner life is being managed, and it must be managed. The question is, how are you managing it? Christians manage the inner life through the Spirit. And the Spirit uses the word in prayer. That's why we emphasize it. Now, I've just shared a wrestle that I've had, that I had. It's verses like this one in 1 Thessalonians that really helped me. Picture the wrestle that I had on the inside, doing the right thing on the outside, but I needed to let go and just trust that God was enough on the inside. Look at this. I would go to this verse often. My God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. What does that mean? Make you holy. It's a process. Make you more like Jesus through and through. Do you see that? Through and through. Trying to translate a complex idea here in the very deep recesses of your, of your life that nobody else sees but God. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, do you see how thorough this is? May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I love. This is what I held on to. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will help you do it. Is that what it says? He will do it. He will do it. He will be able to transform those parts of me that I'm afraid to trust to him. Oh, Craig, surely it doesn't even mean sexual identity, does it? Well, the previous chapter, it does. See, chapter 5 is basically a summary of what Paul has said. Well, let's have a look at what he says in, in chapter 4. This is how deep this goes. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're wrestling with. Cultivate the inner life, and God transforms you from the inside out. Look at this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Same word, that's the connection. Made more like Jesus. Where? In the deepest recesses of your body, through and through. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who what gives you the Holy Spirit. All of this, verse 8, is possible through the Holy Spirit. In other words, it really doesn't matter what your wrestle with is on the inside. If you cultivate that inner life with God, if you deepen that intimacy with Him, if you maintain intimacy with Him, God will start to change you from the inside out, and your faith will not be a matter of outside in that looks good, but on the inside you may be more bound than anybody realizes. No, it is about the inside out where God even has the power to change the desires of your heart. That's the kind of faith I believe God is calling us to. But the reality is each of us have an inner life that's being managed somehow. Is your life being managed like this? Or is it being managed through your own strength? Friends, if you follow that through, you will quickly find yourself following Jesus because you made a commitment to follow him 25, 35, 45 years ago. That is not dynamic. God wants more. Now, secondly, as a result of this, the more our inner life reflects our outward behavior, the more Christ-like our personality becomes. Again, there's nothing wrong, and I hope you hear me say this, there's nothing wrong with us imposing external discipline on an internal desire that doesn't yet reflect the holiness of God. That's not wrong. It's just not the best. That's good, but it's just not great. God wants greater things for us. But in order to do that, we need to recognize that the inside needs to change. Now, this is where the church has difficulty because expressing the inside is actually a very difficult thing to do. Now, anybody know what this is? 
This is a digital pen, by the way. Some people said it's a pen. No, it could be a pencil, it could be anything. It's a digital pen. Anything, anybody know what we had before this? We had pens and pencils, right? What do we have before pens and pencils? We had ink, we had quills, we had parchments. What do we have before that? Well, there's rocks and a cave wall, right? The point is, for as far back as we go, humanity has always recognized that it's really important to give expression to those things that people can't see or haven't heard. We've always found that to be important, so important that we've invented technology to do it. Well, a number of years ago, I think it's 2013 now, Apple decided at one of their, um, their big product launches that it was now time to make a big deal about emojis. Apple never invented emojis, but they certainly jumped on the bandwagon. And one of the reasons they gave at that product launch was that, hey, in the world we live in right now, we all need help to express our emotions. So they jumped on emojis. Any of you use emojis in your text? Yeah, Kim, you certainly do. Uh, those of you, how many of you like me haven't got a clue between the, uh, I haven't got a clue what the difference is between, between some of these emojis? I haven't got a clue. If you're like me, then you're in trouble because in a few weeks, I believe another 120 are being released. So there's even more to confuse us. But, but the point I'm getting at here is Apple jumped onto this because they recognized that we live in a world where it's really difficult to express emotions. It's really difficult to express or to give credence to or reality to or substance to those things on the inside. Emoji technology was designed, seriously, it was designed to help us be more comfortable with expressing emotions. Now think about this. How many of you have been to church for like five years or more growing up? Come on. Humor me, go, go with me, a lot of us. Now, ask yourself this. When you come through the doors of a church, were you encouraged to put on your intellectual mind to the exclusion of your emotional inner self? Because if you were, that's pretty much like my reality. It's as if my mind was fed, but my inner life was often starved. Uh, it's often interesting for me when our worship team goes into a set, and they did that this morning, by the way, intentionally. You know, the, the second song, Worthy. There was that moment where Bree said, sing out a song to the Lord. Hands up. How many of you freak out with something like that? It's like, whoa, that, that, that's really uncomfortable. What's happening here is the inner self. It's the part of the dynamism. You know why we do that? Because we believe that life with God is supposed to be dynamic. We're not, suppo- we're not intending to freak you out or to shock you. We're not going to go extreme or anything else. It's a, that reminder that, wait a minute, there's an inner life here that needs to be cultivated. There's an inner life here that needs to be expressed. And if we can't cultivate and express that in here, where are we going to cultivate it? Now, don't, go, don't get confused. I'm not an expressive type. The most I'll do to dance is kind of like this, and and that's about it. You may see me go like this. I've shared this before. It's not about becoming something you're not, but it is about when the work of the Spirit is on your heart, it is about you getting the freedom to realize there's nothing wrong when you start to sense God do something on the inside. There's nothing wrong. God wants to sanctify us on the inside through and through. See, denying this reality doesn't help us cultivate a dynamic relationship with God. And see, the problem is our inner life determines our character, our qualities, our vices, our virtues, what we value a lot, and what we don't even value at all. That's not an external thing. That's an internal thing. Our inner life drives our loves, our hates, our fun, our fears, even our secrets, all in the inner life. It's the part we can keep hidden, but it's the part that those people who know us the best, they know it, they see it. That's because our inner life determines our response to our outer life or the part of our life that other people can perceive, like what we say, where we go, the gestures we use, our words, our smiles, our scowls. When our inner life reflects our outward life, the more Christ-like our personality is actually becoming. But to get there, we have to acknowledge that it exists, and we have to be intentional about developing it. 
Because the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and through the practice of prayer reveals the changes that God needs to make and desires to make on the inside. I'm wrapping up with this. Our inner life has power. Paul says that you will be renewed through and through in your inner man. There is power in your inner man. And the question is, who or what is shaping your inner person? The inner life is real. The inner life is powerful. And the inner life needs to be managed. How are you managing yours? The, The reason that we emphasize prayer and the scriptures is because these are the tools the resources that God uses to begin to reveal to us parts of our inner life that need to be developed, that need to be challenged, that may need to be inspired, that may need to be encouraged. And my encouragement to you is as we head into hopefully a post-COVID world, is that you would make the commitment to embrace a dynamic relationship with God Our faith is more than a ritual. It is a relationship. Live into and lead into that relationship. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the work of Jesus that has made it possible for us to enjoy a relationship with you. Father, I don't know where people are at in terms of the dynamism of their relationship, but God, I just pray that right now something from what has been spoken would just have shone the light in a part of our heart where we know we need you to work in us. Father, our faith is that inside-out faith. And we just pray that you would work in us so that there would be that consistency between who we are on the inside and what we do on the outside. And Father, for those people that are here right now who, who are being faithful, but that faithfulness is about exercising external control on internal realities that that are afraid of overtaking their life. God, I pray firstly that you would encourage such people, that you would enable them to trust that who you are is more powerful than anything else. And God, I pray that they would find real freedom that comes from a relationship with you that is deepening and that is maturing and is growing. And Father, I pray that as we journey through the next few weeks, that you would speak words to our hearts about what is truly essential. And may we remember, Father, more than anything else, that we are your children, that you have us in your hand. And may we trust you enough to reveal ourselves fully to you. Do that work in us, Father, we pray through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Now, you can see I've asked the the team to come back, and I want to ask Bree to join me here for just a second. Um, What what we do is we, every week with a sermon series, we do questions that are a little bit like this. And um, if you go to this section of our website, centralwesleyan.org, centralholland.org, current series, you'll be able to find this. The reason we do this is because we recognize that we will often say something here that you'll need to go deeper into in the time to do it. So we put those uh, messages or those questions out there. Now, if you are joining us online in the chat portion of the uh, portal, you'll actually be able to see this link. You can click on that right now. It'll open up that page in a separate browser, and then you can look at that later on. But Bree, what, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to ask questions. I was just thinking as I did this, some people may think I'm going to make an announcement at this point. There's no announcement. Chill out. It's relax. It's, it's all easy. But w- what I do want to do is I just want to take a moment here to emphasize the inside out, right? Because I mentioned the worship, and uh, sometimes when you come up with you or Hannah or whoever else it'll be, we'll have this little label. They'll go up there, and it'll say worship leader. But you know we don't refer to it like that inside, right? We say, no, what we are is not worship leaders but lead worshipers. 
And we say that because it would be really easy for you, for Hannah, Nate, you all realize how blessed we are with the people that lead on the stage, right? These, these are amazing people, but, but, but all too often, right, people will look at what you do and they'll think, well, it's easy for you to do it because you've got great voice, right? You've got an amazing gifting that many of us are jealous of, but that's really not what it's about, right? It's actually about the, the life coming, that's in coming out. Could you just share with us for a couple of months, what do you do to cultivate that inner life? Because if you were to rely on just your gifting alone, you would dry up quickly. So what do you do to cultivate that inner life, especially in an in inner life, when the outer life is seen by a lot of people a lot of times? What do you do? Well, hey, Central Family. I'll say this, that it really is all about the heart's posture, where we're placing our heart. When it comes to singing and music and the gifts and talents, like God understands that. He's the creator of all of that. And at the end of the day, above all else, he truly desires our hearts. So when I'm, every time I have the opportunity to come up on the stage, my prayer first and foremost is that God will be seen. And how I do that is in the secret place, in the quiet times, in the times that you don't see me. I'm sitting and I'm spending that time with God because, see, this is the thing. The posture of our hearts should always be that we are seeking to know God by being known by him to make him known. So I'll say that. Now, one, one more question, then you're going to sing a song for us. But um, as an African-American woman today, right, a lot of pressure out there, a lot of challenges that, that you've gone through. And then it's really easy for people to look at the externals, whether that's, you know, the, the color of our skin, but also whether that's also to do with just you doing something. And then going back to Revelation 3.1, which says, hey, Sardis, I've got this against you. People think you're alive, but inside you're really dead. You go through seasons like we all do, where it's just really tough. Sometimes to get up here and do this, when there's things going, out, are going on out in the world, there's things that may be going on in our lives, and you come up here and week after week, whether it's you or whether it's Hannah or whether it's Nate, whoever it is, and, and you have to lead us. How, how do you lead out when on the inside it's really tough? How do you deal with that? I feel like I need to just, you know, express that I've just come out of and still even traversing through a season where it's been really hard. I mean, we can talk about the country, the state of the country. We can talk about the things that have transpired during COVID. It's been really hard. And many times have I walked up to the stage, once again, grab me the mic, I'm asking God, what do I do? And what do I say? When on the inside, I feel so empty. How, how can I express what's going on, on the inside but still lead others effectively in worship? And two things practically that I've made a practice of doing. One, I love to create history with God. And how I do that is when I open my word, when I sit and be still to hear from his voice, I date it. So when I look back, I can see, oh, God spoke to me here. His promises, he spoke to me about this. I'm seeing his faithfulness, and that just, that just cultivates this overwhelming sense of feeling that God is with me always through the highs, through the lows, through the mountains and the valleys. And the second thing that I do that I believe we all should be doing is it's creating space, intentional time just to sit with him. Oftentimes in prayer, we find ourselves being the, in a monologue almost, where we're the ones speaking, we're the ones talking. God, we're saying this. God, we need this. God, this is this, this is this, this is this. But when the most important person shows up in the room, we pause. We st we're still to listen. And a lot of times in prayer, I wonder if we take our time to pause and hear from God. Whether you hear from him right then and there, or you hear from him later, when we begin to magnify and lift up the name of Jesus, he shows up, and he shows up in mighty ways. So my father used to say this. He used to say there's two times when we should praise God, two times and two times alone, when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it. And that just speaks to the heart posture of God. My heart is yours. I can bring a sacrifice of praise to you when I'm feeling it or when I'm not. And it, it's what brings me to the space of, of pouring out, praying that it's from a place of overflow because I've spent the time with God. Bree, thank you for sharing that. I, I wanted to do this um, part of the, this, the message today because I can often just talk about this and, and we kind of leave it there, but I just wanted to bring a little bit of the culture that we, we try and cultivate from the inside, even from, uh, from the stage here, and, and just talk that out. Now, one of the things I love about this team is that they are creative. 
and uh, that they'll write. And the song that I've asked them to, to sing here, it's just a song that talks about the glory of God because that really is something that should drive all of us. Again, prayer and script, reading the Bible and praying doesn't prove we're faithful. It just prepares us to be faithful. Right? What creates the faithfulness? It's the goodness, it's the grace, it's the glory of God that while we were still far off, Jesus died for us. That's how we know that he loves us. And I pray that the desire of your heart will be to go back to the truth of this song over and over and over again, that the motivation through life will be the fact that God loved you so much that Jesus Christ died in your place.